at the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. My parents keep on telling me just being here is winning. Although I know it isn't so. But it's a very nice, very, very nice, very, very, very nice, nice, very nice beginning. Uh, I'm uh, William Morris Barfay, and I am the winner of the Putnam County Spelling Bee. And while that hasn't happened yet, the reason I know I'm going to win is because spelling's already a second hobby for me, but nobody has my magic foot. My fake mom, Sheila, got me these shoes. They'll help me win. Hello, my name is Logan Schwartzengrubenier and I am competing in the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. I'm super excited because I am the youngest competitor in this competition, so it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge for me, but it's gonna be great. The bee really combines all of these things, education, hard work, pride, so it's a really great example of that. And I think I'm gonna win because I think I'm the most mentally and physically prepared for this type of competition, and I just really have my eye on the prize. I'm Alva Ostrowski, and I'm going to win the B because I've really, really been studying, well, as much as I possibly can. I, my, my parents haven't been home, but um, I've been working really, really, really hard with my dictionary. Hi, um, my name is Leif Cody Bear, uh, and I should win the spelling bee because I placed, and I think I have the best chance. I'm Marcy Park. Why wouldn't I win? Hi, I'm Chip Tolentino. I won last year's Spelling Bee, and if I'm being honest, I'm gonna win again this year because, yeah, it just last year happened. One of the big challenges on the show is that everybody involved in it knows it intimately, and the original performances were really iconic, and uh, most of us have either uh, been in the show, worked on the show, saw it a million times, and so it's hard to get away from exactly what someone else did. And because the show was created um, by the people who, who were performing it, so much of it is idiosyncratic to them. So one of our big challenges was how to make it fresh and, and make it our own. Um, and we did that by really trying to approach the, the script we, as we would any other new musical. So um, not assuming we knew the answers, diving into it, we asked uh, I asked the set designer, Jason Sims, uh, to give me something totally new and different to, to physically force us to, to, um, to re-examine moments. Um, and I think we accomplished it. There are certainly um, pieces of it that um, there, there are jokes that land that we may, um, uh, we may have re-found something that someone else found before. And there are other places where our interpretation is totally different. Um, but all of it is, is discovered covered fresh uh, in the rehearsal room. So, um, I had a job um, on the original production as a wrangler. So I was one of the people who, um, who convinced audience members that they wanted to be on stage. It was a really fun job. Um, I did it for know, maybe a year or so. I would get to the show just before the audience got there, and then as people sort of descended the escalator uh, to come down towards the lobby, I would sort of, uh, I would descend on them uh, and convince them that they wanted to spell and be in the show and find the people who were going to be the best spellers, and, and there was a whole uh, system of then moving them towards someone who interviewed them, and then we got them trained and put them in the show. So the show is about a group of middle schoolers, but they're played by adults, and um, and it, it gives us a tremendous freedom that we wouldn't have if we actually had middle schoolers. Um, and uh, amusingly, I just uh, I started rehearsal almost immediately after spending the summer um, running the Bristol Riverside Theater summer camp, Art Rageous. Uh, so I spent all summer with middle schoolers uh, and then went into rehearsal. And middle schoolers are hilarious. And, and um, you know, unlike either in elementary school or high school, by middle school age, they're they're becoming who they're going to be, but they're not, we're not fully formed yet, um, personality wise. You know, if you say to a six, if you put a 60 year old in a situation, if you know them pretty well, you can predict how they're going to act. Um, and, uh, and we sort of are who we are at that point, And we're a little more rigid. And with middle schoolers, um, they're starting to become that, but they're still a little unaware of social conventions and a little unaware of, um, trying to conform. And they're just on the brink 
brink of starting to do those things. They're still they're still free and um, uh, and unpredictable like little kids, and they can be goofy and silly and have fun and be hilarious the way that really little kids can, um, with just these glimmers of moments when they recognize how the social interactions are happening. They can morph and change, and they don't have to be so rigid, so that the the um, the really shy, painfully shy uh, kid with anxiety sometimes is really bold and really loud and cracks jokes and laughs really hard and forgets that they're the shy kid. And the kid who's who's starting to build walls and seems like he's he's tough and mean. Every once in a while, there's like a little squishy spot where 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 he giggles and and lets someone in. And um, so we've been playing with with those ideas of 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 where the kids are, um, who they're trying to be and when uh, the other side sort of gets through. Oh. This show is like a prop playground. Um, so I said to the uh, props mistress um, at the very beginning that I wanted her to just a room filled with props. I didn't know what I wanted. I, we, we would not know whether we needed a basketball or a football or a soccer ball or a lacrosse stick or a hockey stick. We just knew we needed stuff. So to just fill the room with stuff. And we got to rehearsal and there was like a goodie bag of items and said to the actors, have at it, find stuff in there that that, that your character wants to play with. Um, and as a result, they have used I think almost everything that was in the room. We use a football, we use uh, a basketball, we use scooters, and we just played. Well, we never know when someone's going to get out. So, um, and there are songs that happen when people get out. So the the orchestra has music that they never know when they're going to play. Uh, just yesterday, we were talking about some lighting cues that have to happen that we don't know when they'll go, and you know, and everything's just computerized and you know, starts here and you just keep going and it's progressive. And then there's these cues that we have to figure out how to get to that could happen anywhere. Um, and to a certain extent, you, you don't know what someone's going to do on stage. I mean, I, I, um, we're picking people who we think are really good spellers. The show works best, the better our audience members spell. Um, but you never know who tells you they're a great speller and they're not or who panics when they get on stage. Um, so it's totally, uh, it is totally unpredictable. We don't know who's, uh, it's not planned. We, we truly do not know who's going to go out when. And, and um, Robert, who plays Panch, um, is picking different words every night, right? He doesn't want to use the same words for the spelling contest every night. So he's got this book uh, of, um, of words to choose from, and, and he's constantly coming up with new ones and, and trying to come up with new definitions to make us all laugh. I would say I think one of the things we've really focused on on in this show is how to make each of these characters real. Um, each of these characters has idiosyncrasies and they're um, they're weird kids. They're funny kids. They've got their th this spelling bee really really matters to them, um, and um, but they're in the most awkward part of life. And what we've tried to do is is find the the honesty in that and make sure that um, that the kids that we're putting on stage are are we're not laughing at them. That these are honest portrayals of kids. Um, in a spelling bee who really, really want to win and are working really hard at it, however weird and idiosyncratic they are. Um, there's a huge amount of humor and comedy. The show is hilarious, um, and it comes out of that awkwardness um, and individuality. But... Um, but it has to be, for it to work, we have to recognize these kids. They have to be real. We have to want them to win. Um, so that's, um, that's really been a big focus. We've spent um, a lot of time watching videos of kids at Spelling Bees. Um, if you haven't watched all of the National Bee um, YouTube channel, I highly recommend it. They're, the kids are funny. Um, and, and they're only funny because they're so completely honest. There's, there's no pretense. They are simply trying to spell words. And that may mean that they do it by holding their thing in front of their face and saying it, or it may mean that they've got a weird tick where they're doing this with their fingers, or they may, um, some of them sing the letters to certain tunes, others tap out a rhythm and do it that. Everyone's got their thing of how they do it, but, but they are truly 
just trying to spell a word. Um, and and the honesty of that, I think, is where the, the comedy comes out. Thank God my school did not have spelling bees. I was such a bad speller. Uh, it was, um, elementary school was rough for me. <laughs> it was not my finest time. Um, yeah, one of my elementary school teacher's favorite lines was that um, to tell my mother that Amy marches to the beat of her own drummer, and I spelled things the way I wanted to spell them. Also, my school taught spelling phonetically, um, which I guess gets you reading faster, but then they didn't really care very much about spelling. I went to a weird school. So um, it, it was, yeah, my, my, uh, my grades improved dramatically when spell check was invented. Well, a music director is one of the most flexible, um, flexibly distributed roles in all of musical theater. There can be um, there can be as many people as a uh, music director, a, a rehearsal pianist, a vocal coach, a vocal director, a vocal supervisor, and then of course you need a keyboard player usually for the orchestra. So sometimes those are divided among several people. In my case, I, I'm all of those people in one. So um, your, your, your role really varies on where in the rehearsal process you are. And um, sometimes you're functioning as um, in a really directorial capacity, trying to kind of really get an overview of things. And other times you're really an underly, you're just kind of providing what's needed that day for rehearsal. And so the trick is really, I think, to know um, um, what's going to get us to that next step on any day and what your role is, you know, on that, on, at that particular point of the process. Because there are so. people, a lot of people work their way up um, in theater by kind of playing piano and then eventually, you know, getting asked to fill in for someone or whatever. In my case, I uh, actually have a master's degree in orchestral conducting, which seems like the furthest thing away from doing musical theater. But actually, um, that's how I uh, that's how I was trained as a conductor. But I always I've just always loved musical theater. So I've sort of kept it a part of my life, a part of my path. And to, to, an honest answer to the question is sort of I've, I've just fallen into it. When I've been around in a given city or a given area and there's a production going on, I've um, been asked to do it and I've said yes. And it's always been fun. Yeah, I think this is one of those shows that's pretty open to um, kind of performer participation in the, cre in the kind of recreation of the music. Um, it's a, I'd call it, it's not quite a rock musical, but I, it's very much in the pop end of the spectrum. And so what that means is that the music is written out, but it's sort of agreed upon, I think, implicitly between the composer and the music director, pianist, that, and even uh, the singers too, that, that what's written out is, not a, um, is, is, is more of a guide. Um, in fact, William Finn often writes these little slash marks in the score, which, you know, that's pop or jazz notation, meaning <laughs> four beats, do whatever you want, you know. And so uh, when, you, when I listen to the Broadway cast recording, I can hear the music. He was a wonderful music director for that production at, at uh, Circle in the Square. Um, it kind of just does his own thing, and it's, it's you know, he, he has the... the the kind of the basic basic architecture and the harmony and of course all of the necessary landmarks that are there for the for the song to sound like the song but then um, uh, he goes beyond that and he does um, he adds riffs he revoices chords he he does that kind of thing um, so when we were in early production meetings for this show Amy told the set designer I'm paraphrasing of course but something along the lines of something in the spirit of, I don't care what you do, just make it different from the Broadway production because she was involved as a, as you know, as an audience wrangler for that. And she saw it hundreds of times and just wanted to, wanted to start fresh. And so one of the outcomes of that is that the band ended up being behind the set, which is not an uncommon um, way to go. Um, but uniquely, she's she makes a joke out of this there's a there's a magic hallway back there 
uh, where these kind of gym doors sort of open and various things appear back there that wouldn't in real life appear back there. And one of the things that happens is in Marcy's scene when she, um, you know, goes and says she plays the piano and does Mozart and all that, the doors are open and the band gets revealed back there. Um, and she kicks me off the piano and, and, um, and plays. So we're just living back there the whole show. And it's, it's, it's a fun treat to, to have that kind of gimmick involved. Cause usually when you're behind a set, you know, you don't get, you know, you don't get seen unless there's a curtain call at the end or something like this. But in this case, we incorporated that, um, that, uh, set design element into the show, which I think is fun. We've rehearsed a lot. Uh, you don't always get that. You know, sometimes you have, um, for a two-week rehearsal cycle, you'll have a day or so up front to rehearse the music, and that's that's it. Um, we've done a fair bit of review as we've gone, and then we've um, I've taken extra time with cast members outside of staging rehearsals to review things. Um, so we've worked pretty hard on getting it to sound good, I think, with the cast. Uh, now, the band is always a different story because you only have those musicians for a few days. We've rehearsed uh, just two band rehearsals, and then um, they'll do a sound check and a, and, a, and a run, and that'll be it. So, But, of course, they don't have to memorize their parts and dance and sing and all this other stuff. They can, And they're excellent sight readers and wonderful players, and so they're, they're used to kind of coming in and just nailing it quickly. Well, I really wanted to make the ensemble harmonies really pop and sound good. Um, the show was written quickly, and some of and the vocal harmonies are very, very kind of tight. And um, it's one person on a part, which is very difficult. You know, if you have a chorus of say twenty-five or thirty people, and you've got a three or four-note chord, then you've got ten or twelve people. You know, eight, ten, twelve people on a note. In this show, you have one person on each note. Um, and any singer will tell you that's way harder um, because every individual has to just do more to match tone and be in tune and all that. Um, so that was a real challenge. I really wanted to make sure that the cast felt uh, and sounded as though they were really singing what was there, singing what was written. Um, so I'd say that was the single biggest musical challenge, vocal challenge. <laughs> in fourth grade, I won my classroom spelling bee. So then I went on to the school-wide spelling bee from which they, you know, select the person to go on, I guess, to the county. And I went out on calendar. I spelled it with an E-R at the end. But I was in fourth grade. Now I know better. Monday on Navigating Life. We are going to be talking about the importance of maintaining and controlling your balance as we age. If you don't challenge your balance, it doesn't get better. Check out a new episode of Navigating Life every Monday at CourierTimes.com. Tuesday on Cook This. I'm making a cinnamon potatoes with a yogurt dill sauce. I know what you're thinking. Cinnamon on potatoes? Mm-hmm. So good. Check out a new episode of Cook This every Tuesday at CourierTimes.com. Friday on In the Garden. Today we're at Howell Living History Farm. People can visit throughout the year helping us with the actual farming operations. Check out a new episode of In the Garden every Friday at CourierTimes.com. Sunday on Ask the Pet Vet. Well, we're going to start talking about microchipping horses in the future. If your horse were ever to get loose or get stolen, you'd be able to find them. New episodes of Ask the Pet Vet every Sunday at CourierTimes.com.